and welcome to another Dirobes modeling example. This screencast will be a walkthrough of building a simple Jeffcut rotor and running a few analyses. For those that have the book by Chen and Gunter, what we'll be doing is working through example 4.2, which is a Jeffcut rotor. This is a small, massless, elastic shaft with a central disc supported by two very stiff bearings. So kind of keep this example in the back of your mind as we work through this. And what we're going to do for this screencast is walk through creating this model, running the undamped critical speed analysis, and looking at the mode shapes, then running an undamped critical speed map, or creating an undamped critical speed map. Again, for this simple Jeffcott rotor example, 4.3.4. Or sorry, 4.2, which is in figure 4.3.4. All right, so for Dirobes 18, the first thing that comes up is this uh, dialog box. It gives you the option of starting a couple different programs. We're going to be doing rotor modeling, so we want to start the rotor code. So we'll click on the rotor option, and this will let the code start up. And this brings us to Dirobes Rotor. First thing we're going to do is create the model. So we go to the Modeling tab, open up the Data Editor, which brings up this tab dialog box of, of all the model entry uh, information. First thing we want to do is set our units. We're going to use English engineering units, so pounds, force, pounds, mass units. And this is very critical, the, the, unit, the example is in this, and this is very critical. If you don't get the unit set correctly, you're going to get really strange results, and this is probably one of the more common errors that I see in the, in the short course that I do on die ropes. So we'll maybe call this Jeff Cott Rotor. I like to put uh, some sort of description on there to help me figure out what this rotor was, you know, six months later down the road when I have to come back and do something with it. You can also put this descriptive text onto a number of the plots. Next thing we do is create the material. Uh, this is essentially a massless material, so we're going to put a very small, very small mass, 1 times 10 to the minus 10, not quite 0. 0 sometimes does some weird things uh, numerically, so we'll put nearly 0 and otherwise properties for steel, 11.5 E6, and we'll call this dummy material. So that's got the material all defined. The next thing we want to do is define our shaft elements. So we click on the shaft element tab, brings up this set of op input options. The two defaults, speed ratio of one, starting station of one, that's what we want. And the two axial distances, the axial distance and the y distance zero, these are the offsets, are zero, which is what we want for this model. We'll call this maybe shaft, just to help us remember what it is. And then we want to start defining the elements. So this will be element one. And we'll use sub-element 1. That's the first sub-element. Always 1 is where we start. Sub-elements are a feature that Dirobes has that lets you put more model detail into a model without significantly increasing the, the analysis time or complexity. Uh, we'll select, select material 1, layer 0. Layers like sub-elements are a thing we can put a little bit more model detail in. We'll talk about those in, in maybe other podcasts, uh, screencasts here. Uh, length of 1. Mass ID of zero, it's a 3 8 inch shaft. And one of the interesting things about rotodynamics codes, it's a little different from most other finite element codes, is we actually have inputs for one geometry for mass, and we can optionally have a different geometry for stiffness. And this helps model things uh, in real rotors a little bit more accurately, so this is fairly common in rotodynamics codes. So in this case, it's, it's just a plain Jane shaft, so they're equal. Element 2, sub-element 1, material 1. Layer 0, length of 1, ID of 0, 3 eighths of an inch OD, 3 eighths of an inch OD, and so on. And I'll pause this briefly while I fill in the rest of it so you don't have to sit through that. Okay, so I filled out the rest of the table. You see it's 10 elements, all identical, length of 1, 3 eighths inch mass, and stiffness ODs. One thing you'll discover rather quickly about dirobes is that the tab key does not but you shift from column to column. You have to use either the arrow key or the, or the mouse to select different columns. So that gets our shaft defined. Next thing we would like to do is define that central disk. So to do that, we click on the disk tab. It brings up this input screen. We have a couple different types of disks that we can do in dirobes. In this case, we're going to do a rigid disk. The other option is flexible, so we type an R in that first column. It's going to connect to station 6. It's a 10-pound disc. Diametral inertia is 80. Polar inertia is 50. And one useful thing about that, that goes on with all these 
dialog boxes and, and input screens is down at the bottom there's almost always in all of them an indication of what the units are, what units Diarobes is expecting you to use. In this case it tells you mass is in pounds mass, inertia is pounds mass inch squared. So if you get confused or uncertain about uh, units, that's where you go find it. Uh, another useful thing to know is that a lot of Diarobes screens have context sensitive help. So you can either click on a help button, which in this case we'd have to close that out. We could click on a help button or hit F1. Either way, it will bring up uh, some help information that may help explain how the input works. In this case, it describes the differences between the rigid and the flexible disks. So the help information in Diarobes is something that's very useful when you're unsure of how an input should work. The next thing we want to do is define the bearings. There are two bearings in this system, so we click on the bearings tab. The first bearing will connect from station 1 to ground. Ground is denoted as station 0, so this is now a bearing from 1 to ground. It is a linear constant bearing, which is the bearing type we would like to use for this analysis. We might call this our left bearing. The example wants us to have very stiff bearings, so both KXX and KYY, our direct bearing coefficients, are 1 times 10 to the 10th. Gain units down at the bottom, pounds force per inch. There's no damping in this bearing, and we have no rotational stiffness or damping. So that's our first bearing. We add our second bearing, which goes from station 11 at the other end of the shaft. So this is the right bearing to 0, which is ground, and Dirobes has um, copied over the stiffness information that we had from the last bearing into this bearing. So this completes the definition of our of our model. We've got units, we've got a material defined, we have shaft elements defined, we have a disk defined, and we have bearings defined. So we can go ahead and save that. We'll maybe call this Jeffcott. And there we have our rotor model. And as you can see, it looks very much like that, uh, that drawing out of the textbook. So the first thing we'd like to do is take a look at the undamped critical speed analysis. So we go up to the analysis menu option. We choose lateral vibration. That brings up this uh, set of inputs. We choose critical speed analysis. And then we look at this this for the critical speed analysis inputs. They are located in a box, sort of set out with a box here. There's three options. We can pick a spin to whirl ratio, which in this case, spin and whirl being the same is a good thing. Five modes. We're just going to calculate the first few, so calculating five will work. The final option is stiffness. We have a choice of several different options for bearing stiffness. Since the bearings are symmetric, they'll all give the same answer, so we can just leave this as its default KXX. Once the options are set, we can click Run. The model will run. It'll run pretty quickly. And if there's a problem with the model, uh, that Run window that popped up very briefly there will generally give an error code. Uh, and the help includes a listing of error codes and hints on how to resolve some of them. Our model ran with no errors. Yay! So the next thing is to look at the results. To do that, we would select the post-processor. We would be looking at critical speed analysis post-processing. And we have four options. We have a text option, a mode shape option, an energy distribution, and modal stress or displacement. The text option brings up a very detailed accounting of everything that's in your model, all your model inputs. Uh, it also tells you what the rotor mass that it calculated was, useful for checking the model, and gives you some detailed information, in this case, the critical speeds. However, that text information is usually not as interesting and useful a way to post-process the models, so we look at the graphical outputs. In this case, the mode shapes is where we would like to start. So this is the critical uh, undamped critical speed mode shape for the first mode. Uh, it's a critical speed at 2215 RPM. Uh, we can animate this to take a look at what it sort of what it looks like as it's vibrating. And one thing I'll note is this critical speed of 2215 is a little bit different uh, from some of the results in the textbook. Uh, the textbook 
starts out showing you the whirl speeds at 0 and 10,000 RPM, which are slightly different. Those are the natural frequencies at those speeds. The critical speed here is the natural frequency coincident with spin speed. So there's some slight differences if you're trying to correlate this uh, screencast to the text. Uh, the other difference is that in this example, this example I'm working here, we've done this the way we do a realistic rotor where we leave gyroscopics and shear effects on. The example in the text turns both of these effects off. So this is kind of what the first mode looks like. We can implement, look at the second mode. We don't have to turn the animation off to do that. So we see for the, sort of the first two modes. Stop that. If we wanted to change some things, we could go into the option settings. That would let us, for example, add the description or change the disks or ver do various other things that we might want to do to change the way that this looks. So that's how we look at an undamped critical speed. Another thing that we might want to look at or do a lot of times for a rotor dynamic analysis is run a, generate a critical speed map. So for generate the critical speed map, we go back to the run option setup. We select the critical speed map option. Then there's a box, a sort of outlined area that has a set of options for the undamped critical speed map. We're going to set some of those. The spin to whirl ratio of one, that's what we would like. That's synchronous forward modes. In this case, a bearing stiffness of from one to 100,000 is uh, going to give a decent looking critical speed map. And we would like to vary all the bearings. You could also vary just one bearing or two or, or some various options. So we click Run. It runs fairly quickly. To post-process this, again, we go to the post-processing option. We click for the post-processing for the critical speed map. Again, we have a text option, which in this case is generally not the thing you want to look at. And we have a graphics option. So we look at the critical speed map. It looks something like this. This map default by default dirob shows the first three modes on the end of critical speed map, which is maybe not what we'd quite like to look at. So we can go options, settings, and set it to just show us the first two modes. We have some other options here. We could also add an operating speed line here. Uh, we might turn the minor grid on, which will help this look a little bit better. So we click OK to those options. We go back to our undamped critical speed map. And it looks kind of like what we would expect for the first two modes of a, uh, of a rotor like this. So we can now sort of see that the that uh, first critical speed intersects uh, 1800 RPM, would be at about you know 1500 RPM, which would, or sorry, at about a stiffness of um, I don't know, was that maybe 1,200 uh, pounds per inch? So any stiffness less than 1,200 pounds per inch, we would actually probably have a mode below running speed, and we'd have to get up here to a stiffness of I don't know, two, three thousand pounds per inch uh, to get the first critical speed to be above running speed for this particular case. So that's a real quick look at how we would create a model. Again, we go to the data editor, define units, materials, shaft elements, disks, and bearings. Generally, we almost always define those. We might define some other features of our model. We do that all from that editor. The analysis, lateral vibration, this is where we do our runs. We pick which option we would like. Set up the, the run input using the various boxes on this screen, run it. And then we do our post-processing viewing from the post-processor option. And again, they all have a variety of different things that we can use to look at the model output. So that's a real quick look at example uh, 4.2.3, I believe it is. Um, I'm sorry, 4.2. Example 4.2 from the uh, Gunter and Chen, or Chen and Gunter text of a very simple Jeff Cut rotor.